All right, well, welcome to this keynote session. Uh, I'm Bruce Davey, the general chair of the P4 Workshop, uh, and I'm very excited today to be joined by probably two of the most influential people in the P4 universe. Um, we'll be joined a little bit later by Nick McEwen, who really needs no introduction, um, but right now I'm, I'm joined by Sachin Cutty, and uh, Sachin is the CTO of the Network and Edge team at Intel, uh, so part of Nick McEwen's empire there at, at Intel. Um, but Sachin and I actually go back a long way. I can remember when Sachin was a, a graduate student at MIT while I was uh, working there. And uh, these days, he's got this uh, very significant role in the networking team at Intel. In between those two things, he's been a professor at Stanford, and he also founded a company called Yuhana, um, which ended up being part of VMware. So we've actually been co-workers uh, at one point in our career. Anyway, Sachin is uh, an absolutely fascinating networking person and I won't take up any more of his time. I'll just let him speak to you about his, uh, his vision for programmable networking. Over to you, Sachin. Thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, today I uh, really want to talk about what's happening in edge computing and the drive that it is creating for programmable networking uh, at the edge. As uh, Bruce mentioned, uh, we have crossed paths many times in the career, and it's an interesting kind of point in time where I'm spending time right now in Intel trying to flesh out what the edge uh, technology strategy is going to look like. And we see an enormous need for programmable networking uh, at the edge. So before I dive into why we need programmable networking, let me set some context. What is actually happening at the edge uh, and what kind of edge is emerging? So this was a little bit of a a pleasant surprise for me uh, after spending the last couple of years at uh, VMware and Intel in terms of seeing what kind of transformation uh, is happening uh, at the edge. So to me, the edge is everything outside the cloud data center, and that is actually a massive amount of infrastructure. Right? So what we think of as the core network that connects us to the internet, all of our cellular networking, as well as a lot of uh, compute uh, that is happening uh, on premises in uh, factory floors or retail stores. Uh, I'll just call that the on-prem edge. And one of the things, if you look under the hood at all of these different edge locations is that uh, they are being built on programmable silicon. And this was a surprising part. I had expected that a lot of these systems uh, that we use every day, like cellular network infrastructure or many of these IoT applications would still likely be using fixed function appliances, right? So fixed function hardware and tightly coupled software on top. But what has happened almost very uh, unnoticeably, but in a significant way over the last few years is that all of these being uh, is being built on programmable silicon. The silicon itself is heterogeneous. It's not one kind of silicon. So you have obviously CPUs, uh, but you also have new kinds of silicon emerging uh, like the IPU and SmartNIC, and uh, as well as acceleration cards uh, for a variety of workloads uh, like AI and uh, telco workloads. But make no mistake, we now have a programmable silicon platform underneath uh, that is driving a lot of these uh, edge applications. So what does that imply? Uh, so what, what is, what's actually going to happen because of this, right? And one of the things that, uh, is that, that we are noticing that is going to be very relevant uh, even to the research community in terms of uh, what research directions to drive is that the software stack itself is changing, right? So if you take a look at uh, what you would consider many of these edge applications, right? So they were IoT, uh, enterprise networking with things like SASE or 5G workloads like 5G Core and VRAN. Yes, they are being built on programmable silicon. And uh, I'm happy to say a lot of it is from Intel, uh, but after that programmable silicon is essentially packaged with vertically integrated software that's running on this programmable silicon and being delivered as a solution uh, that, get, that, that gets deployed to build out this edge. Right? And that, that's, 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 that's working quite well. A lot of these deployments are proliferating and people are building solutions this way. But from a, from a research perspective, what's happening, what's likely to happen in the future perspective, uh, you see this inevitable thing that happens in technology, which is that we go from vertically integrated stacks to more horizontalization as people uh, begin to uh, understand what are the kind of needs that cut across verticals, and it makes sense uh, to start actually building horizontal software stacks uh, that, uh, that can deliver common services uh, to a variety of applications. And that I, we are predicting will happen uh, at the edge, right? So we will see this uh, shift from vertically integrated appliances to more horizontal platforms where we will have a consistent composable end-to-end -end fabric that stitches together computing, storage, and networking. 
and you will have platform layer services that will enable you uh, to deliver a lot of these edge solutions as applications uh, on top of this edge fabric. And make no mistake, this fabric uh, is an easy word to say, but it's a fairly complex thing to build because you're now talking about software and networking that is spanning many, many, many different uh, physical locations, right? So the on-prem edge probably in numbers in the hundreds of thousands, telco edge probably in the thousands and the colo edge in the hundreds, right? So it, several levels of aggregation, but still you're talking about going from a public cloud where maybe there are three or four and they're giant massive data centers to literally hundreds of thousands of deployment points that need to be stitched together in a fabric. But that's where uh, we believe the future is. And all of these applications uh, <clears throat> or solutions get delivered as applications on top. Now, obviously the challenge with anything distributed is how do you actually manage such a highly distributed deployment? And that's where having a cloud delivered distributed orchestration and management is gonna be critical to abstract the complexity of such an infrastructure. So that's kind of the backdrop. You have a programmable foundation with the silicon and the software we believe is going to transform into these more horizontal layers and will try and deliver on this abstraction of a seamless fabric uh, that spans end to end uh, from public cloud uh, to the on-prem edge. Now, what does this imply to especially this community? Uh, I do believe that this naturally requires that we need to have programmable networking because many of these workloads will want to assume that the network will get out of the way and will be stitched together in a manner uh, that applications can be deployed across all of these places much more seamlessly. They can move seamlessly and the developer does not need to understand uh, what is happening at the hardware layer underneath and how the network actually gets constructed. And this community has made amazing progress in delivering that kind of abstraction uh, across different kinds of hardware. So as I was mentioning, the edge is being built uh, with a variety of different kinds of hardware from CPUs all the way to IPUs and switches. And P4 has been an amazing success in actually being able to deliver a, a, a framework that is write once and run anywhere, right? So run on any of these. And one of the things uh, that uh, that has happened uh, with, uh, from Intel especially is, how do we do it in a manner that even if you're writing a networking application to run on a CPU with DPDK underneath, you can still write it as a P4 application, a P4 program, and you get compiled down to the right kind of uh, underlying software or hardware backend. So that really gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, it allows you to stitch together the data plane of the network in a write once, run anywhere kind of model. So you don't have to make choices or make assumptions about what kind of hardware sits underneath. And that really drives uh, code portability. But one of the things I wanted to kind of spend a couple of minutes uh, today uh, highlighting was this is not sufficient, right? So this is the lowest layer of the network in some sense. You're doing uh, programming of the data plane, exposing a common control plane interface, and you're stitching together what the, uh, what the plumbing looks like but in a, in a, in a hardware-independent manner. But modern developers are actually living at a much higher layer of abstraction. So if you go talk to a developer today who is building a modern cloud-native application, they are talking in terms of stitching together their applications using a service mesh, uh, using gRPC to talk between two microservices, and leveraging Kubernetes and container networking to actually build out the compute infrastructure and stitch it together. And finally, using abstractions like Kubernetes and Kubernetes operators to access accelerators rather than having to deal uh, with the details of the underlying hardware. So if you step back, what's really happening is that the modern application developer is living at the infrastructure layer and the infrastructure is being, uh, the narrow waste for that infrastructure is really this Kubernetes and PaaS layers uh, rather than the lower levels of the network stack uh, like we've been used to before. And many of these uh, services at the infrastructure, whether it's for storage, memory, accelerated computing are being uh, delivered or, or are planning to leverage the network in, in interesting ways, right? So we are all familiar with RDMA, we are all familiar with uh, kind of uh, distributed storage systems in a cluster. Uh, we are all now experimenting with how do I use acceleration over a network, especially for things like AI. So all of these are capabilities that the developers are expecting will be delivered to them as services rather than them having to go figure out the details. And so one of the kind of observations we have is that programmable networking is evolving from being kind of 
sufficient to being something that is sitting underneath uh, what we call infrastructure processing and that infrastructure processing needs to be uh, abstracted out and needs to be delivered again in a target agnostic manner so that we can expose all of these capabilities uh, to the developers uh, developers on top. So that's where uh, I, this effort around IPDK is an open source effort that uh, we'd love for all of you to join. It's, uh, it's the, the, the idea is that this whole infrastructure processing layer uh, that the developers need can be built again in a target agnostic manner and can leverage things like P4 underneath it for networking, but we can also extend the same philosophy to other compute models uh, around storage and memory and acceleration that deliver these capabilities uh, to these developers. And I think this is a necessary building block to actually building open programmable infrastructure. So we have this vision at the edge that people should be able to stitch together uh, the hardware and the software building blocks and be still make it uh, such that it is very modular, it works well integrated and it is easy to manage. And one of the key pieces of this is gonna be just making sure that software is portable. And that's where IPDK comes in so that you can write your software in a manner for infrastructure uh, management, infrastructure processing that it can run anywhere and really gives you the confidence uh, that you can stitch together different hardware and software building blocks uh, to actually build out uh, this open programmable infrastructure. So if I were to leave you with one message, it's that when we think about programmability in the network, uh, that is now getting kind of going to a higher level of abstraction as far as developers are concerned, because they consume the network and other pieces of infrastructure at a higher layer of software abstraction uh, with things like Kubernetes. And so we need to start thinking about how do we deliver programmability at that layer and how do we abstract out the complexity of the underlying infrastructure so that developers can build out these edge applications uh, uh, much more much more easily. And uh, IPDK is one piece of that puzzle towards delivering that vision of an open programmable infrastructure uh, for the edge. So I'll end with uh, an infomercial for Intel. So Intel obviously is uh, committed to this uh, open uh, world and really kind of what, uh, what the goal is to actually build open software frameworks uh, that will allow uh, developers to build a variety of these edge applications. So I talked about the lower layers of the stack around P4 and IPDK, but uh, many of these things that I'm listing here, whether it's things like FlexRAN or SmartEdge or OpenVINO stacks, many of you are probably using some of this software. Uh, the idea is that as you go up the stack, you need you can actually take these software building blocks uh, to build out uh, applications for VRAN, to build out applications for inference, to build out uh, applications like CDN on top of Smart Edge, and they are all leveraging this uh, programmable abstractions underneath that allow you to land it on any of the hardware footprints uh, that you'd like to to at the edge. So with that, uh, really thrilled to 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 be talking to this audience. Uh, the, the takeaway message I'd say is that the edge is, is this really exciting new place where programmable silicon platforms are already proliferating, but there are big, hairy, open research challenges around what are the software frameworks going to be, what are the abstractions going to be for programming this edge, and how do we build out these uh, edge fabrics. Uh, with, I, I, I think there's an amazing set of uh, research questions uh, that, is, uh, that, that, that need to be addressed uh, that this community is very well equipped to. With that, I'm going to uh, st uh, stop. And thank you so much for inviting me again. And uh, I was really thrilled uh, to speak to this audience. Well, Sachin, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Very, uh, very compelling vision of, of where you see the industry going. Um, people will have a chance to ask, ask you questions um, later on, and I'll probably get in a few of my own. But before we do that, um, I want to welcome Nick McEwen uh, to the virtual stage. Uh, Nick probably needs uh, no introduction for this audience, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, Nick and I also go back a long way, um, even further than, uh, than Sachin and I do. Um, but uh, Nick really changed my life by, uh, by encouraging me to go and, and join Nasira, um, where I got to be part of the emerging commercialization of SDN. Um, and uh, you know, Nick has done probably more things in his career than, than almost anybody I can think of in the networking world to change the shape of, of networking. And of course, he's widely viewed as the founding father of, of P4, so hence well known to this audience. So, um, and now you're both at Intel, um, and so obviously it's uh, of, of great interest to us what you guys see as the, as the future of, of this space, and, and you're obviously in a position where you can have a lot of influence 
um, maybe even more than you could have had as, as just mere Stanford professors. Um, anyway, so with that, I've, I've got a few questions to, to sort of kick us oh. off. And I thought maybe I'd just start with Nick with a very broad question. So, you know, B4 has been around for quite a long time now. Um, and, you know, it's it started off, I think, with this quite bold vision um, of, you know, changing the way we build and operate networks. Now that it's, you've been doing it for, I think, at least half a dozen years, um, how, how's it stacking up compared to your expectations? Oh, oh uh, thanks, Bruce. Great to, great to see you. If we do indeed go back a long way, I can remember standing um, by the bar at a sitcom event where you and I were debating the pros and cons of OpenFlow. And uh, the um, I can't quite remember how the debate went because uh, we'd had a few glasses of wine, but when it, it, it really starts with OpenFlow in some ways. And if you think about where OpenFlow came from, it was this desire that many of us had, and I think there was an industry craving for a handing over of the control of how networks are run, how they're operated, how they're managed, uh, from the equipment vendors to those who own and operate vent, uh, op operate networks. And that was a sort of the theme of the 2000s. And uh, OpenFlow was a direct consequence of that, which was, okay, if you need to be able to control the, the switches as if they're peripherals, they need a simple API. The mistake that we made was to think that it should be a simple and fixed API. And it turned out to be too static, too, too limited in what it could what it could do. And so really around about 2010, 2011, just as SDM was finding its feet and there were lots of interest and there was Nisera with network virtualization and there were various other programs going on, particularly at the cloud service providers. Um, you know, some of us, myself included, were a little concerned that it's all very well to move the control plane into the hands of those who own and, and operate the network. But what about how packets are processed? At the end of the day, uh, a network is merely a means to take a packet from one place to another. And if you can't change the way in which the packets are processed, you know, well, you don't really have the, the power and the control that you, that, that you think you have. So to answer your question to how successful has that been, I think the primary way in which it's changed our industry is it's changed a mindset. Now you can have an expectation that you can change the way that the packets are processed. You can, you can expect that you can modify it for adding fields for congestion control, the state of the switches, telemetry, things like that. And if you want to add in more fields for SLV6 or new things that come along before the next generation of fixed function switches, then you can now think about how to do that. You may not always be able to accomplish it, but at least you can contemplate it and say, oh, I don't have to battle through an IEEE standard, an RFC process, and then go and persuade a fixed function silicon vendor that they have to spend $100 million on adding the feature that I need in the next generation. I just write a program, right? And so I think it's changed that, changed that thinking. We've still got a long way to go, right? But it's, if it's moved that conversation from fixed APIs, fixed functions, and fixed function limitations and constraints into enabling us to think that we're programming a device, programming a set of devices, programming a pipeline. And uh, that's, I think, is the, the biggest success. Has it taken off commercially in the, way that, uh, in the way that we had envisaged at that time? It's been different. And I think it's often the case when there is a change, it morphs into something that you hadn't quite expected. When we started SDN, I thought that it would be largely about lifting the control plane out of the equipment up into a central location. For some, it was that. The biggest early change was probably in overlay network virtualization of the, you know, the, the VMware NSX style and uh, you know, many others who have gone down that same, same path. I, I wouldn't have expected that. And I think this is, this is what happens when there is a change that people do things that you hadn't expected, particularly if it's programmable. And that's kind of the whole purpose, right? We wouldn't, when the CPU was invented and the C programming language was invented, we wouldn't have predicted, I don't know, Google search or uh, Facebook or, you know, many of the applications that we have today. That's the power of putting the hands into the hands of the developer. And when you look at what, what um, Sachin was talking about just now, what is the opportunity that we see that we have to, uh, you know, in service of the industry more broadly, it's to show up with, with tools, with hardware and with APIs and libraries that help developers 
do their thing, right? To make their infrastructure shine, to make it zing in a way that we couldn't, right? That's to, to give them the ability to do that for them for themselves. And so I think P4 is a part, it's a building block in, in being able to do that. It was a sort of a missing piece. And so, okay, we've got that building block in. So what are the next building blocks that, the, that we need? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm sort of still uh, unclear about, I think is, you know, to what extent are the use cases for P4 sort of niche applications versus which they're, they're very mainstream. And, you know, so you know, when I talk to people who are building switches, there's still a lot of market for the switches that just do the things that, you know, you, you already knew you needed them to do. Um, and it's, it seems like, yes, we find, you know, what I would think of as niche applications like doing telemetry. So do you have a view on that? Do you, do you think that's a fair assessment that, that P4 is filling niches as opposed to sort of being the, the, the sort of the, the, the default for, for building networks? So first, I want to take umbrage with the, with the comment that uh, telemetry is a niche application. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a little bit like saying that uh, logging was a niche application of deb debugging a computer. Uh, it's something that wasn't done in the early days. Mm. It wasn't something that could be done easily. And it wasn't until there was register level support in CPUs to provide low level detailed logging that you could really rebuild and retrace what had actually, what had actually happened. So I think nowadays it's a pretty much a requirement. You can do it in a fixed way, in a limited way, right? With, uh, you know, counters that you update and you read every few milliseconds. Or if you choose to in your environment, then you can add something which is more tailored to the specific environment. But I think te telemetry is mainstream at this point and an expectation. And over time, I would expect it to become more fine grain, more detailed, because I think still it's the case. We have very limited visibility into how networks work. And so I think this has been the, the, the something of the transformation because you no need to no need to worry at the time that you're building the silicon where do I put the field what am I actually measuring how do I interpret that field you can decide that later in terms of a program having said that and you know I agree with everything I you know I, I passionately believe in everything I just said I would I would say that we're in the early stages still of that that, that transformation because it takes a certain courage to be willing to try out new I try out new ideas, particularly when you're trying to operate a net network at scale. One thing that we did notice with Barefoot in the early days was um, the primary interest of, of uh, cloud service providers to start with was either to throw things out. They would look at the fixed function switching silicon that they were using, which at the time had, if I remember correctly, 45 features and protocols of which they typically use somewhere between four and seven. It's just that they each use different, slightly different uh, subset. And all of the rest of those features, they were a liability because you never knew when they were going to trigger and create a, a problem. And uh, so there were some, some, some cases where cloud service providers had these outages that were caused by features that they didn't even know were running, protocols that were running in their, in their network. And so one of the first things they wanted to do for security reasons was to get rid of stuff that they didn't have expertise to be able to, to detect and debug. So, you know, that's a strange use of programmability that I would never have predicted, which was to reduce the set down to those that you, that you actually need. And it's got something to do with the, the nature of the job of building a fixed function device. You have to have everything in the kitchen sink that you can possibly manage the superset of all of your customers would, would need. And this is why we found to be honest, to our surprise at Barefoot, that the first Tofino switch actually had slightly lower power than the fixed function alternative. It's counterintuitive, right? Mm -hmm. I certainly hadn't expected it. And it wasn't because it was some kind of magic in the circuit design, although there was a little bit of that. Most of it came from the fact that the use cases were simpler than the ones that they, the fixed function ones that they were replacing. Now, when you look at uh, the, the, uh, the, the other kind of use cases that have come about, some of them are niche or some of them are new. And depending on you know, your excitement level, you can look at niche as new or new as niche, depending on uh, how you view that, 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 uh, that particular feature. SRV6 that I mentioned earlier is a good example of that, that sort of proved interesting to the 5G community of where you can have much more control over the forwarding and routing. You could use MPLS, right? <laughs> you could use label, any type of label that would allow you to do that in many, many yeah. different ways. It just proved convenient with the particular um, protocols that were present in order to be able to do that. But adding 
a, a stack of, of V6 labels into a into a switch that wasn't designed for it. It's just you just can't do it. So programmability helped there. Um, the gateways between um, the between uh, sort of old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things have proved uh, sort of appliances. There have been you know various uh, various cloud service providers uh, who have taken this path. Alibaba talks fairly openly about the use of um, P4 programmed appliances uh, in order to be able to do the translation from their commercial system into their cloud system that allow them on 11.11, the uh, singles day, in order to be able to move all of the commercial traffic onto their cloud offering. And they did that with a very elaborate set of translation appliances that they have programmed including load balancers, dip dip gateways, and uh, other devices. And then there's the mundane. And the mundane is where it gets used as a top of a rack switch or a spine switch. And uh, that, some, that usually falls into the category of doing less, throwing out the features that you don't need, so it's less of a liability. And sometimes there'll be the judicious add of someone's favorite feature. Again, it could be niche that goes away after a generation. It could be something that then finds uh, grounding. Uh, congestion control being one of them. Marking of a of a field. So, for example, you know you've seen the the variants of as you go through as a packet goes through. For it could be just a regular data packet. Um, uh, keeping track of which switch has the highest queue occupancy and only maintaining one field. It's a natural thing to do, and then feedback. It's an easy program to write if you've actually got the switches there. So let me end by saying that it's, it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, which is the, you know, you can't write the programs till you've got the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And these kind of changes of, of persuading people that they should forklift upgrade their, their hardware in order to be able to program it, it takes a while. And uh, so, you know, it, it'll, we'll probably still be having this conversation to some extent in another five or 10 years, because we'll say, well, it isn't over yet. It isn't finished, right? And it does, it, it does always take a while. And so I, you know, the nice thing about being at a place like uh, Intel at such, Intel at such scale is you can play the long game and say, yeah. okay, it will take a while. And you're not necessarily going to get everybody to change their mind in the first two or three years. They've got other things to worry about. They've got legacy code, they've got legacy APIs. And you know the the current way that these systems are built tend to be locked into fixed, closed, proprietary APIs that the equipment vendors have kept uh, under NDA and kept closed. Why do you do that? You don't do that because you want to encourage innovation. You don't do that because you want to encourage new ideas. Is it because you want to cynically lock out other people from from entering the market? So you know, as a researcher in university, you can't change that really. You have to do that at scale with investment over the long term. Cool. So, <laughs> There's a lot to, lot to chew on there. <laughs> Sanjay, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment. I mean, everything Nick said uh, and uh, kind of an additional perspective. I think there's, there's a difference between P4 uh, as a switch, right? So that's where it originated. But I think P4 as a programming abstraction that allows you to write these up in a variety of systems, right? And I think that's an important distinction because uh, let's take the edge again as an example. I think the edge is going to have a long tail of unique networking needs. Uh, whether it's for 5G UPF or the 5G RAN in terms of what kind of networking they want to need. Uh, like Nick was mentioning, SRV6 as an underlay for writing a lot of these 5G applications on top or even your fixed networking applications on top. So where, where I'm, where the, the point really is that portability and the ability to customize the networking that you need and the edge is a domain where the, the needs are going to be such a long tail that there is not going to be one single thing you could build you really need that ability to be flexible. And that's where I think this programmability is gonna be super important because you need to be able to customize it uh, for this uh, long, diverse set of needs. Yeah, it's funny, this is really making me have flashbacks to when I was at Cisco because you know we actually had a lot of pain getting MPLS into the, the forwarding hardware because it wasn't designed for that initially. So we would have loved to have more programmable hardware back in those days. Um, yeah. But so we're going to run out of time pretty soon, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about about IPDK 
Yeah. And because that, that's a, a very compelling vision, I think. And in particular, this idea that you need to come up with a higher level of abstraction before you can really open up this sort of programmability to the masses. I mean, Martin Casado has often said, really, most people don't want to program networks. You know, mm -hmm. it's one thing to say, you know, millions of people program applications, but that's because, you know, writing general purpose application code is something that you can do a million different things with it. Most people don't want to program networks. Um, so I really like this idea of having an abstraction layer that sort of lets the programmable network be available to application developers without them having to delve into the details. So I just want to know, like, like, you know, getting a big effort like that off the ground is hard, right? Getting an open source community to grow is, is, is a big challenge. Yeah. How do you, how do you see that playing out, getting this IPDK thing to actually launch beyond, you know, looking, looking great in a, in a, a PowerPoint? Yeah. No, so first the, 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 let's talk a little bit about the need and then I'll talk about the, how, you know, the how, so, um, and, uh, so, you know, right now, the whole field of having a programmable packet processing pipeline in an end host um, is new. And so this, once we have that, and we have that widely deployed, then we'll have, of course, the ability to modify the user application, the, the operating system through EPPF or DPDK in the user space. But then through the, the NIC or the IPU, you'll be able to program the behavior of the packets inside that uh, processing pipeline, and then the switch, and then of course into the host at the other end. Now you've got a pipeline from end to end that you can express in a, in a, common, a common language. Right now, except for ABDK, all the solutions are closed and proprietary. And uh, I think that closed and proprietary is the enemy of innovation. And it's the enemy of creating an open ecosystem where great new ideas come to bear. And so, you know, I'm a big believer. I, I get almost uh, take it as a, take it as almost an insult when an industry kind of takes this approach. And, you know, it's, it's the first mover advantage. You do it to try and lock it in. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe that's, that, that, that's the right thing to do early on from a business perspective. Long term, it constrains the size of the market, it constrains innovation, it constrains what people can do. And so if you're a cloud service provider, you don't want to be going in the direction of keeping it closed. You want to have uh, code that you can write or things that you can express that would work over a number of different targets from a number of different vendors, a different class of products, depending on where you're doing it. And ideally open in the sense that the APIs are open and perhaps hopefully that the entire ecosystem is open source as well. So you get this wonderful uh, sort of force of amplification from a large community all pulling in the same direction. I think a good, now let's get to the how, I think a good use case of this is Sonic. So, you know, I think many of us, myself included, look at Sonic in the early days and said, wow, that's a huge lift. Uh, there were many open source switch operating systems at the time, and um, most of them have gone our way. And the, the one that was left standing, there's a reason for it. Microsoft invested significantly in Sonic and they uh, made it a condition of anyone that's showing up to sell them a, a switch silicon that you must port Sonic to it. And this is absolutely the right way to do it because now you're forcing that neutrality, forcing that, uh, that portability and that sort of target independence from the beginning. And the company in this case who understood the problem because they were deploying networks at scale was the one who were the only ones that could actually determine what that would look like. And um, so what we think will happen with IPDK is the same will happen again, that we'll have this uh, you know, group of, of companies who actually have real problems to solve, who will then develop the code, insist that that neutrality happens from, from the beginning. I think it's now a proven model and I expect that that's what will happen with, uh, with IPDK. This is, this is not Intel specific. I hope that the entire ecosystem of target providers will also take part. But the most important thing is the cloud service providers, the telco operators, anybody who has a real need for these problems to be solved, that they will, they will take part. And uh, that's what will lead to its success. Yeah, just to add maybe Bruce, I think the story of modern development, application development is abstraction, right? So 
every every few years another layer of abstraction emerges that makes it easier for developers to write an application right? so we've gone from ip to all the way up to service meshes now which are at the at this the really the highest layer of the stack and uh, and the challenge of course is that these abstractions people want to experiment with people want to change it uh, all the time and potentially they can hurt performance, right? Because you're uh, adding in so many layers of abstraction. So there is a natural need to make sure that these abstractions can be delivered in a performant manner with hardware acceleration whenever it can be. But it should not come at the expense of that agility for this abstraction to evolve. And that's, what's, what, that's what was happening in the market, which is people were taking abstractions and delivering it in a vertically integrated manner with the hardware. So IPDQ's vision is how do we, give you the benefit of that abstraction, give the benefit of that easy to build applications, but do it in a manner that it's open and you can leverage the hardware's capabilities, whatever it is, uh, without losing, uh, without getting tightly coupled in, into that. So if I now take a look at this, who does this benefit the most? It's really the people who are delivering the development platforms to all of these developers, right? And I think uh, that's where what Nick was saying, which is uh, it's, it's, we should figure out how to make sure this is a requirement uh, when, when we are delivering hardware that uh, accelerates the developer's experience uh, uh, in building such in these modern applications. Yeah. Well, look, I, th I think that's probably a pretty good note to finish on. I, th I think, you know, this, this vision of, of how we're going to make life easier for developers. And of course, you know, you can pretty much retire if one you've created enough new levels of abstraction so i think you guys are, are doing a great job there <laughs> um so i think with that um we should probably uh probably wrap it up and and let, let the audience go off to other other sessions but um nick and sachin really great to have the chance to hear from you today i, I do think you've got a, a a huge opportunity here and it's great to hear kind of where you see the industry going and and i wish you all the best as you uh, continue to push programmable networking forward thank you bruce it's always great to see you thank you bruce